And we're live. Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined again by Electric Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. And this is a special episode of the Wheelie Podcast because this time it is sponsored by Upway. Uh, Upway is a leading online e-bike provider carrying the broadest selection of brand new and certified pre-owned models. We're going to hear more about them later in the show. But first, we've got a number of interesting stories from the past week to cover. A real wide variety this week. It's everything from new e-bikes from Propella. We've got uh, drastic price drops by Rad Power Bikes. Uh, we've got a real snakes on a bike story. Um, a cool DIY conversion kit for uh, converting any bicycle, basically, into an e-bike. Um, news from Rivid, uh, an electric motorcycle maker based in California. A uh, sort of non-bike bike gear review on a bike drone. And uh, some interesting testing of some uh, household uh, heat pump-based appliances. So uh, let's see, where are we going to start off with this week? All right, this clever kit turns bicycles into electric bikes using their disc brakes. Yeah, this one kind of like blew my mind at first because like here at Electric, I mean, we've seen basically every type of e-bike conversion kit, right? And like, there's not that many different styles. You've got your mid-drive motors, you've got your hub motors, and you've got friction kits. And that's largely everything that's out there. And suddenly this electric bike conversion kit comes out of left field with something completely different. And that excites me. It's called the Scarper. And the way it works is there's this sort of bolt on package that clips on to the left side of the bike's uh, chain stay. That's the lowest frame member back by the rear wheel. And there's a motor that drives the disc brake rotor, the part of your disc brakes that spin around. And that's what's actually turning the wheel. There's uh, there's no wires, there's no throttle, so there's nothing to run up to the handlebars. It is pedal assist. And basically, to install it, you first swap out your disc brake rotor, and you use theirs, which it has an extra little sort of indexing wheel on it. So the, the motor's not actually driving the braking surface of the disc rotor, which was what I thought probably happened at first, but they've got a you know more clever way to do it. Instead, it's, it's almost like a gear system built into the inner part of the disc rotor. That interfaces with that motor that's in the sort of clip-on part of the kit, and that's how it drives the bike. And the cool thing is that not only can this convert any bike that has disc brakes into an e-bike, but very easily you can go backwards and you can take it off and suddenly your e-bike turns back into a normal bike. So if you don't want that extra weight, or maybe it's like a training bike where, you know, some days you want the, uh, the extra power of an e-bike, but other days you want to go, you know, all by yourself with just your power. And you don't want that extra weight of the e-bike kit hanging out there if you're not using it, especially if you're in like a hilly area or something. And that's a lot of extra weight to lug around. You just take this off. And I think what they said is you're left with just a few grams of extra weight because that uh, new disc rotor weighs a little bit more. So in theory, it's a really cool idea. Now, because this is a UK-based company that developed it, that means that we're talking about uh, European e-bike laws here. So, you know, it's lower power. It's 250 watts. Um, it doesn't go very fast. It's 25 kilometers per hour. That's about 15 and a half miles per hour. So, you know, a, a very low performance system, or I guess that's as high performance as you get in Europe. So maybe they don't consider that low, but to a uh, North American standard, we would consider that fairly low power. Uh, it's also a little bit pricey. I think the price was something like 1300 pounds, which is about $1,600 or so. And, you know, there are a lot of electric bikes that cost significantly less than that. Uh, so... Uh, if you're looking at just sort of like dollars per watt, which a lot of us tend to do, and admittedly is not the best way to judge an e-bike, but it is a, a quick and easy metric. It, it doesn't stack up that well price-wise, but of course, from the other side, you've got all those advantages of an easily removable e-bike conversion kit. So uh, I'm kind of split on where I fall on this. What do you think, Seth? Well, first of all, like very intrigued by this. I mean, it's a great idea. I had to like double take when I first saw it. And it's, you know, like you don't think of the brake uh, rotor as being a point of strength, but obviously if you're able to stop the bike with the brake rotor, it's got to be pretty strong. Um, so 
that's very interesting. Also, like, does it have to <clears throat> does it have to be a specific type of brake rotor? Because I saw on on the uh, the one, it's got like it looks almost like those analog brake um, bike rotors, or is can it be any kind of bike rotor? So, so they actually supply their own, uh, and it does have what looks like that um, sort of index on a on an analog brake, but I think it's it's more physical than that. So it you know matches in with whatever gear system they have, but they okay. give you the disc rotor with the kit, so you just swap it on. And I think actually you can kind of see there that the the pattern on the braking surface doesn't match the front brake. So you can see right. like you'll end up with sort of a mismatched rotor. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, it's cool because you can take it on and off pretty easily, uh, you know, I'm assuming here, but um, it's not something that you could take around like a Copenhagen wheel, for instance, and put on any any bike. You have to actually take the rotor off, which is not a huge deal, but it's 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 not something everybody wants to do. Um, so that's something also, I, you know, like I, I still like when I think about 250 Watts, that's not a lot of power, but it does seem like a lot of power going into that tiny metal thing. That's, you know, spinning around. And like I said, it stops the bike. So it's gotta be pretty hefty, but I, you know, it, it's like one of those things I got to try out. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I guess they've, you know, tested and tested these things, but, uh, yeah, it is sort of a, a strange application to a piece that's not normally driven in that way. I'm like trying to check the physics in my head. If it's driving it in the same stress direction that you do when you're braking. Oh yeah. Uh, the torque there, I guess it wouldn't matter. Like, I guess it's supposed to be, it would be the same. Well, but they do. About... They, I mean, they have like a direction, you know, like the arms come out in a, in an arc from the center. So there is okay. like a, a directionality there. And I mean, I've even seen people bend disc brakes when they usually when they're already getting really hot from like going down super long mountain roads. Right. And then you apply like serious force. Like, you know, you can you can actually push a, a disc rotor past its limit. But I assume that because they're using their own rotor, they've designed it to withstand that. I've actually seen uh, on downhill bikes, uh, my own downhill bike, uh, smoke coming from the uh, disc brakes <laughs> uh, so uh yeah. i i guess a lot of stuff can happen there um i do like the low center of gravity though like that's going to be you know pretty unnoticeable in terms of like bike balance and stuff which is great um i you know i think it's a great idea um obviously it probably would be a little bit more sketchy on smaller wheeled bikes because uh, you know that thing's gonna be a lot closer to the ground and maybe outside of the uh, the wheel uh, radius, but um, definitely an interesting application. Want to keep an eye on that one. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on here. Propella has their Mini Max launched as a eight ninety nine electric utility bike, finally with a throttle. Yeah, this is Propella's first ever throttle e-bike, which as a US-based company is kind of a rarity to see a, to see a maker that still hasn't endorsed uh, throttles. So um, this is their Mini Max. I think it's the second version of their Mini bike uh, and the first time they, they put a throttle on, which is exciting for probably 90% of uh, e-bike riders in the US that prefer throttle to pedal assist, or at least prefer having the option to use a throttle when they're tired. The bike itself, though, I've always liked the mini platform from Propella. Um, they're this company that they've always sort of focused on minimalism, you know, very simple, usually single speed bikes. They have one colorway. It's uh, black on blue. So like the whole bike is blacked out except for these really pretty blue anodized rims. And basically it's sort of a what you see is what you get type of bike. In this case, you're talking uh, small 20 inch wheels. So I think there's something like two or two and a quarter inch tires. So you know, still pretty meaty as a utility bike. Uh, in this case, they've updated it with a rear rack, which is great for anyone who wants to, to carry things, especially, you know, middle, minimalist bikes are not known for being great for utility. But it's also super lightweight because it's so simple. It's something like, I want to say 38 pounds, maybe 40 pounds. Um, so it's just, you know, super light, super easy to carry around. And when you think about utility bikes, you know, we're often looking at Rad Runner style bikes, you know, that class. These can be easily 55, 60, 70 pound bikes. So to see something that's closer to uh, 38 or 40 pounds 
is just, you know, great for this category because we almost never get that lightweight. It sounds probably heavy to someone who doesn't ride an e-bike, but if you say 38 pounds to an e-biker, they're like, where, like, yeah. where, where's the, the wheel that's missing or something. So, uh, that, that's great to see. And in general, I just like what they do here. I mean, you know, you can keep it low price, their price of 899 when you're not overloading these things with fancy features. You know, there's no app that they had to develop. Um, I don't even think it has a color screen. The bike is very simple. Now it does have a small battery. That's probably the one area that is going to be the drawback here. It's uh, 350 or 355 watt hours, I believe. So it's fairly small. If they had stuck with just the pedal assist, it probably would have been fine, comparable to like a throttle bike with a five or 600 watt hour battery. But in this case, because they did add the throttle, I think there are a lot of people that are going to go throttle heavy and I wonder why their battery's dying so quickly. So that is a bit of a shame, especially since uh, a lot of these, you know, minimalist bikes do not have uh, easily removable batteries. The battery does come out for servicing. You can pop it out under the uh, pedals there, but I think you have to, you know, get in there with a screwdriver and remove a cover and uh, unplug the, the wire going into the battery. So it's not removable for everyday use in that sense. So I think it is, you know, important to consider that if you're someone who needs longer range, this is probably not going to do it for you. You know, on pedal assist, maybe you'll get 25, 30 miles, but on throttle, you might drop down to, you know, 15 miles. So that's, that's the one thing I would keep in mind here, you know, great price, lightweight, that's awesome, but limited in terms of range. Um, what do you think of this one, Seth? Absolutely love it. Love it. And I, I actually like, I, I would shout out to Propella because I, I like a lot of what they do. Um, I think they, you know, they, they make really good designs and they, you know, have really low prices for the, for the quality of their, their stuff. Um, what, what is the, uh, weight, uh, rating on the rear rack? Cause I'm wondering if this could be a two person situation. It's a good question. I, I, I think it was 50 pounds. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, I guess I should look that up real quick, but I don't think that it's, uh, going to be a two person bike. Okay. I mean, a lot of these racks, you know, you can, you can do it, but they wouldn't recommend it kind of thing. Right. And I imagine people will still do it, even though they won't, won't recommend it. <laughs> Um, but like you said, I think this is a really good, like, there's really not much like this out on the market. I, I would, I would say like the Luna Eclipse maybe, um, although that's a foldable, um, you know, this, this thing is like, all right, well, you don't need to put it in your trunk, but you still want kind of a compact bike that, um, can get you around pretty quickly for a really low price. Um, the other big question I had is, um, cadence sensor or torque sensor on this one it's a cadence sensor yeah okay. unfortunately at this price that'd be tough yeah yeah at that price that's what i would expect but propella often has like a little bit of a extra stuff there um with the throttle i guess that's okay you can kind of you know if you're not getting that quick pickup you can you know use your thumb to to help out um but i really love uh the the trade-offs that they made here um you know it looks like it has solid brakes it's got lighting built in and you're talking about an 899 from like a, you know, a, a real company, not, not a drop shipper. Um, yeah. pretty good. Like this is, this would be a tempting bike to, to, to pick up. Um, and I just looked it up. It's a 40 pound weight rating and they specifically say rear rack, not intended for passengers. Right. Cause they know us. <laughs> right. Well, they know us bike people that, uh, yeah. so 40 pounds. Hmm. My, uh, my younger kid could probably be on there. Um, <laughs> not in, not endorsed. That's uh... not endorsed. Right. <laughs> um, you know, that's a shame. I mean, it, it could have been a, uh, you know, a very inexpensive, uh, uh, two person, but, uh, all around like really solid bike, love the look of it. Um, and, and you know, the, what I got the, uh, Luna Eclipse and that, that's a great bike similar to this. I think the tires a little bit bigger. The battery's a little bit bigger as well. Um, it's foldable, but um, it's not, it's more of a BMXy looking bike where this one kind of looks more like a cruiser. Um, I, I was kind of surprised there's not really much else on the market like this. And um, it's, it's, it hits a lot of sweet spots. Like, you know, the fact that it's not foldable, like that's gonna, you know, turn off some people, but that also allows them to make a lighter frame and probably saves them at least five pounds. 
So, I mean, this would still fit in a lot of, you know, SUVs or obviously on bike racks. With the 38-pound rating, it's going to, you know, not break your bike rack. You probably don't even need an, an elect electric bike, specific bike rack for this. Or you can take the bike, uh, the battery out uh, when you put it on your bike rack. So, I don't know. I, I, I really like it. I think it's it hits a lot of sweet spots. Is this a, on the market now? Or are we going to have a review? Yeah, I think it's coming in May is the expected delivery date. So definitely a review, but it's it's going to be a while until these things start shipping, unfortunately. Okay. Um, they're taking, I think, $100 deposits right now to um, secure the uh, the $899 price. I think the plan is for it to eventually jump up to $999 after the pre-order is over, which is still reasonable in my opinion. Um and when you're talking about other sort of like BMXy-ish bikes, I was trying to think, and the only other sort of in spirit similar bike I can think of is sort of the Juice Rip Racer, but yep. that one is a is a fat tire bike. And just for fun, I looked up what it weighs, and even as like simple as it is, it's still 66 pounds. Double. So, yeah, it's I mean it's it's crazy that you know when you think about 38 pounds, still sounds like a lot. Like in the world of e bikes, that is nothing. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I like the size of the tire. Is that a standard, a two point two five inch? Yeah, I see those a lot, um, okay. and I think it's uh, I think it's a, a good choice here because they've usually gone with a smaller tire because they started more in like this sort of fixie style um, market, you know, with uh, with those narrow street tires. And so I'm glad to see them go a little thicker here. Yeah, I think they've hit the the right tone on just about everything on this one. Um, yeah, I'll be I'll be fascinated to hear how sales do for them because I just hear from so many people that say like they won't consider a pedal assist only bike because you know even if they want a pedal most of the time they want the um, ability to rely on a throttle if they need it you know even in an emergency and so to finally come out with a, a throttle bike I think you know they're just going to see sales shoot up from people that had never considered them before. And it said uh, you said it's a 550 watt uh, peak. Um, yes. Is that controller limited, or is that something that could be a little higher? <laughs> could, could be hacked with a bigger controller. Right. That's. What I'm um, I mean, the, the sky is always the limit, but uh, yeah, I think you'd have to get in there and controller swap. I don't think you could just go in and change a, a setting or something to get any more power out of it. Okay. Well, I'm certainly interested, uh, and I will be. Uh, you, you said you're going to have a review in May or before that, or yeah, if they get any sort of like pre-production units in, then potentially before that. Um, but if not, then the the actual bikes will start coming in May, so we'll have it then. Okay, cool. Let's move on. Uh, speaking of low prices, uh, Rad Power Bikes announces price reductions across all electric bike models. Yeah, this one is kind of wild. So uh, Rad announced that starting in 2024, they're basically going to keep or close to match a lot of their holiday sales. So, you know, every year we see Black Friday sales start early and earlier this year. You know, I think it was like late October. These sales started going wild in the e-bike market. Yeah. Coming off of a, a very tough year for uh, e-bike companies that have a lot of overstock situations. And so Rad had really great sales. You know, a lot of these bikes were were four or five hundred, seven hundred dollars off. The Rad Trike actually got cut almost in half, I want to say. I think they dropped it from like twenty five hundred to maybe even like fourteen ninety nine or, or something. And and so they had amazing sales and they announced that they're actually going to keep uh, a lot of these sale prices. So I think the Rad Trike is even still at uh, $14.99, if I'm not mistaken, which is crazy for you know a bike that used to be $1,000 more. Uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. So uh, it's just, it's wild. And I mean, this is great for consumers because Rad has always been a great company when it comes to bikes. You know, like they've had hiccups here or there. They've had some, you know, recalls, whatever. But like, you know, at the end of the day, they've always designed and built good quality bikes. And so to get those at, at the prices we're looking at, I mean, this takes us back to rad pricing, like, you know, four or five years ago. Kind yeah, of I was going to say pre-pandemic. Yeah. Like, I mean, it used to be that like rad meant $1,500. In the last couple of years, rad has meant like $1,800, $1,900, $2,200, which part of me is wondering, like, you know, 
obviously you got to think about what caused this business decision. And at the end of the day, I think that Rad has sort of been trying to position themselves as this higher tier brand now that there's so much competition at the bottom. And I, I just wonder if it's not working for them. You know, like I don't have insight into Rad sales. Like I can't look into their um, books or anything, but this is sort of signaling to me at least that consumers aren't accepting this idea that now, you know, these plus models of rads are going to be $2,200 bikes, $2,300 bikes. And so perhaps rad is sort of finally accepting that, or maybe they just have new models coming in 2024 and they want to, you know, get all these off the shelves. I don't know. What, what do you think, Seth? Yeah. I mean, I was curious with the uh, rad runner three, uh, when that came out, uh, we loved the bike, but we were like, that price doesn't make sense. It was at 2,500 and almost like during our <laughs> podcast, I feel like they lowered the price 300 bucks. Um, but it's still, it's like the one bike that isn't marked down. So maybe they're seeing some success there, or maybe, you know, the inventory isn't, isn't matching with the, uh, uh, expectations there. Um, the trike, I, I don't know how that it was ever $2,500, but, um, that's, that's great that it's $1,500. I think that's going to do well in the trike sphere. I also like that they have the uh, small tires. Um, still trying to get my mother-in-law on one of those. And then, um, you know, I, I think the rad runner is like their big, um, it, what I see most around town is rad runners. Um, starting at 1399 is, I think a good starting point for that. And of course, then there's going to be sales on top of sales at, at different points. But, um, I, you know, I think that that's kind of the sweet spot of the, the rad line. Um, it's always been like a $1,500 bike, as you said. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's a middle ground. I think they can occupy like, Hey, uh, you know, we're not going to have top shelf components, but we are going to have innovative designs. We are going to be around. There's going to be some like physical presence in some bigger cities. So we're, we're not a drop ship from China brand. We're, we're, you know, a U.S. brand with, with, that's going to be around hopefully. Uh, and so we demand a little bit of a premium. We're not going to be sub $1,000. But we are going to, you know, have service. There's going to be a lot of uh, accessories. Um, if your bike, you know, breaks, there's going to be recourse. If there's a part that, you know, doesn't work, um, we'll ship something out to you. There's human beings on the other end of the phone. You know, those kind of things. Those are the things you pay the extra, you know, four or five hundred bucks for. And I think that's, I think that's where Rad needs to be. Um, and they and they did try to go premium, I think, and. I don't think that was successful because, you know, to go premium, you kind of have to have like really good components and you got to have like bike shops nearby and you got to have, you know, all those things. And, you know, that, that, that didn't exist. I, you know, rad seemed like it was going in that direction. Like they, they had that mobile service, they had a, a bunch of other stuff, but you can't cut that piece out, but then still demand the higher prices. So I think this is where they belong. I think they'd make great bikes. Um, and I, I hope to see like, you know, if this is, uh, foretelling a new, you know, new, new line of bikes, I'm excited for that. So, uh, all good things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of wondering, you remember when, um, uh, the rad mission was discontinued maybe a year or a little bit more ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was there usually priced at like nine 99, sometimes even eight 99. That was their like, you know super budget level bike and i wonder if part of the reason to nix that was in this push to go more premium and they didn't want to have a bike priced that low and if that's the case i wonder if now they're kind of kicking themselves over that yeah i i uh i mean if if it's profitable like i don't i don't see why they can't have something like that in their lineup um i would love to see like a you know a base rad runner that you know like they used to have the rad runner at you know, thousand dollars on discount or whatever. And that's, that to me is kind of like the quintessential rad bike these days. So if they could get another rad, I mean, it's 1299 now, I'm sure they could mark it down a little bit more. Um, if they could get that out again at, at 999, I think that would be a really popular item. So here's hoping for that. Yep. All right. Uh, moving on. 
a state near and dear to our hearts. Florida woman uses electric <laughs> bike to hunt 15 foot snakes in the Everglades. It's rare that I get to write a uh, Florida man or Florida woman story, but this one was just too good to pass up. Um, it is a little specific, uh, but I, I think we're all going to enjoy this. So um, <laughs> for a little bit of background, the Florida Everglades is just positively taken over by uh, a species of snake called a Burmese python. They grow uh, often over 15 feet long. Uh, they've been found over 20 feet. And they've basically decimated almost the entire mammal and small um, reptile population in the Everglades. So, like, there's almost no deer left. There's almost no rabbits, no, you know, squirrels, no possums, no raccoons, anything. They um, eat deer? They, they eat whole deer. Yeah. I mean, these snakes are crazy. Some of these snakes weigh over 200 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Like, I hope no one's having like a, a panic attack right now. Uh, they rarely attack humans. Don't worry. Rarely. Um, I think it's, I think it's like small children. It can be dangerous, but like, you know, they don't purposely attack humans. They're, you know, they're also constrictors and they're not going to like bite you. Uh, that's, a, that's like a different scary way to go. But anyways, we're getting too far off. Uh, point is these snakes have taken over. They're an invasive species. They came in, I mean, they're native to like Southeast Asia, you know, like the jungles, and uh, they were introduced um, probably through, you know, like uh, the exotic animal trade or people that got these and like couldn't handle them and just let them go in their backyard. And so now it's a huge problem. It's destroying the ecology of the Everglades. The, uh, the state of Florida encourages people to hunt these. There's like no bag limit. They're like as many as you can take, like get them out of there. And so e-bikes have turned into this new snake hunting tool, which sounds kind of odd, but in fact, they're kind of perfect for it because these snakes can be very skittish. So you can't really get in there with like an ATV or another uh, off-road gas powered vehicle because you scare all the snakes off. Um, then in the Everglades, it is not very forgiving terrain. I mean, it's wet, it's marshy, it's like thick, almost jungly. I mean, it looks like Southeast Asia where these snakes thrive. And so you know, getting in with any type of wide or um, dual track vehicle is tough. So an e-bike is like the best way to get around. It's like that or fan boat if there's enough water. And so uh, that's what this woman um, shared on, on her Instagram where she had this like 15 foot uh, Burmese python crawling over the e-bike that she uses to hunt these snakes. And so to me, it's just another fascinating use for e-bikes you know we're finding them everywhere in this case you know as a hunting tool and i think as time goes on i'm seeing this more and more there's like a whole cottage industry of hunter specific accessories for e-bikes even like here we see uh like a deer trailer um but all over the place there are hunters that are switching to e-bikes as opposed to uh, atvs or you know suvs or, or dirt bikes and that sort of thing um, and, and to me, that's just wild how mainstream these things have become that like they've reached every niche, every use case that, that someone could imagine. I'm not much of a hunter myself, but, uh, even just, you know, for outdoors people that are going the same places, like I totally get it. It's a very, uh, accessible way to get somewhere. It's more convenient. It's, it's nicer even for the rider. So it makes uh, it makes total sense for me. I just don't think I'm going to go hunting 15 foot snakes anytime soon. Yeah, I guess uh, they are not great pets, uh, being constrictors. But um, can you eat them? Is it like hunt and eat? That's a good question. Um, I don't think I've ever considered eating it. I, I'm not sure if they're like if it's dangerous. I mean, there's some animals that like their issue like bear meat can be very problematic stuff like that um i don't know if there's like a danger to eating burmese python um what some people brought up i think in the comments that was interesting was this is kind of a sustainable source for snake skin so you know like boots and purses and whatever right. um this would be like an interesting way to to source snake skin um you know like hunting for for sport i'm not a huge fan of myself i mean everyone has different views like i get it you know everyone can do what they want it's a free country but in this case i mean like the the entire ecology of the everglades has basically been destroyed and so killing one animal can actually save so many more and so in this case you know if if you can have some good come of it and then 
it avoids like farming snakes for skin, then that's just another sort of positive outcome here. Someone yeah, gets good the point. boots. Yeah. And uh, yeah, boots, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, it, you, you talked about bikes being better than other, other vehicles. It makes perfect sense to me. Like uh, bikes can go in a lot of you know, more narrow trails than ATVs can go. Bikes are obviously, e-bikes are obviously way quieter. Uh, so, you know, you're not going to scare off your prey as, as badly. Um, the long range on the e-bikes uh, are <clears throat> getting better. So it makes, makes sense on a lot of levels. Yeah, All right. I, mean, it, I think we're going to see a lot of this more and more often. Totally. All right, let's do our ad read real quick. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by Upway, a leading online e-bike provider carrying the broadest selection of brand new and certified pre-owned models. The team at Upway has compiled a growing selection of top brands like Specialized, Trek, Aventon, and Gazelle, each priced up to 60% off retail to make electric mobility affordable to everyone. Want to sell your current e-bike? Upway manages that as well. Each pre-owned e-bike goes through a rigorous inspection, tune-up, and certification by Upway's team of master mechanics and comes with a one-year warranty. Following your purchase, Upway will get your e-bike delivered to you 99% assembled within one week and accepts returns within 14 days in case the bike isn't the right fit for you. The process is easy. Now through January 31st, save up to $1,000 off a wide selection of e-bikes during Upway's winter sale event. Be sure to use promo code ELECTREK for an additional $10 off. Learn more at upway.co. Huge thanks for to Upway for sponsoring. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but we, we did a tour of Upway's uh, Brooklyn uh, warehouse and, and processing center. Um, it was unbelievable how many, like, top tier bikes they have there they 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 get it's not just used bikes but they also get um you know the, when when like overstock you know, overstock yes when specialized makes uh too many of their you know frames or whatever um they sell them to upway and upway is basically you know doing a you know end of year kind of sale uh for specialized because specialized doesn't want to have like a 50 percent off sale on their own bikes so um a lot of the stuff you you see there is never used and uh, in phenomenal shape. And in addition, they have somebody look at the bike, make sure it's you know tight and everything. They put it in this taller box, which means that um, you don't have to screw on the the handlebars. It's basically you you tighten the handlebars and you start pedaling. So uh, great product over there at upway.co if you're looking for an e-bike you know if you're looking for a specialized at you know like half price um that is kind of the place to go so yeah i was gonna ask uh so you said that they'd assemble it at least 99 percent. like what is is left to assemble or oh, you got to put the bell on like how, how much left <laughs> yeah i it, it's basically more assembled than uh what we're typically used to we we're used to having to like screw on the handlebar they they kind of loosen the handlebar and turn it sideways, but it fits in a taller box. So um, the pedals actually are on. Um, everything is kind of there except for like that last uh, screwing the handlebars. Like your handlebars don't fit in a in a bo bike box. So that's it. Yeah, that sounds awesome because those are the the hardest parts for a lot of people. Things like putting those handlebars on. Yeah, uh, just tightening is is a kind of a dream in that in that sense. All right, let's move on. America's latest electric motorcycle maker ramping production and teases new model. Yeah, this is Rivid. Um, they're based in Southern California and they're nearing completion of their new factory that's going to be in San Bernardino. Uh, their electric motorcycles, if you'll remember, we did an early uh, first ride on these back before they were even available to the public. And these are really innovative electric motorcycles. Uh, they are highway capable, so they go about 75 miles an hour, um, but the design is really what makes them different. So they don't use a typical welded uh, trellis frame. The structure of it is basically created out of folded sheet metal, um, and in that way, it's a lot lighter. It's a lot easier to produce, and it's because they manufacture these things in the U.S., it means there are many fewer steps to this. So it's a really cool design and it even adds a bit of modularity because 
by creating multiple bolt holes in some places, you can actually change things like the angle of your head tube, which normally you'd have to buy an entire new motorcycle to do something like that. Uh, and then they, they added in several innovations, like the saddle height can be adjusted uh, up and down by about four inches. And you can even do it while you're riding. There's just a button with an actuator. So, you know, you can have it up higher. And then as you roll up to a stoplight, you can lower it down. So when you get there, you can comfortably put your feet flat on the ground. And then as you take off, you can just lift it right back up four inches. It's, it's kind of crazy. And they've got that battery that um, disconnects. It's about four kilowatt hours and it's got its own wheels. So you can roll it around. So just really cool uh, electric motorcycle company. But the big news is that even though they only started delivering their first model back in September, so about, uh, was that like four or five months ago, they're already gearing up for their next model release. They didn't say exactly when it is, but they kind of hinted around the middle of the year. So I'm guessing, you know, approximately summer um, reveal of the next model they're working on. It's, it's not quite clear if it's going to be on the same platform or not. I wouldn't be surprised if it is because that's uh, sort of a shortcut that a lot of companies are taking these days to uh, roll out multiple models on the same platform so they don't have to you know, reinvent the frame and, and do as much design and, and tooling work. So um, you know, it's unclear how different it's going to be, but it does seem like it's going to be you know, a, a separate model, not just like sort of a, a Rivet Anthem Pro or something like that. So it will be exciting to see it. I wish that we had you know, real details, but as an American-based manufacturer, it's already exciting to see that they not only have one model that they're ramping up production on and building a new California-based factory, but that they're going to have a second model this year as well. So I'll be excited to see that, and you better believe that we'll be here to report it the second they tell us what the heck they're making there. Yeah, and and how are deliveries of the uh, the original model going? Like, if if I ordered one today, how long would I have to wait to get one? It's a good question. I'm not sure what the lead time is. Uh, I've seen several pictures of like dozens of bikes in trailers. So you know they're shipping these things out. It seems like as fast as they can make them. Um, they've also even like had to increase the price since then. So um, you know I think the the demand is good. So I'm not sure what wait time that translates into though. It says, uh, tra- oh, there's training. Sorry, I saw a month on there, but um, yeah, it's but that is kind of a cool thing, though. By the way, that yeah, they um they'll pay up to two hundred fifty dollars for your basic rider training, which is usually the class that you take to get your motorcycle license. And the reason for that is that uh, companies like these are bringing a lot of new riders into uh, the electric motorcycle industry. You know, there are a lot of people that never considered themselves to be like you know a biker, uh, quote unquote before, but suddenly when it's so much more accessible, there are a lot of people saying, yeah, you know, like maybe I can upgrade from an electric bike. So it's kind of neat to see that they're sponsoring people's, uh, motorcycle training classes. Yeah, that is cool. Um, and obviously you make a great point about e electric motorcycles being something that kind of different riders, uh, want to get into rather than uh, you know, your, your Harley or your Kawasaki riders. Um, so how many, I mean, you said you didn't, um, know what the lead time is. Like, are these like, like out on the streets? Like these are, cause I haven't seen one yeah. personally, but I, you know, I live in a cold climate, so I, I wouldn't expect to, but um, yeah, there's um, like a is, very active, sorry, go on. No, I was just like, uh, what is the scene? Like, is there a big rivet population and yeah it seems like it um there there's a very active reddit community where um you know all all the riders go and they discuss like modifications this and that um the american motorcycle market is very big on modifications unlike european riders that sort of believe that like the way the company made it is like the right way um so it is great to see like a very big uh mod community and, and ridership there most of these companies don't share sales figures. Um, they want to sort of keep it kind of um, right. unclear how many bikes they've actually sold. Even though it's a small community of, of manufacturers, there's still some competition there, especially when you've got the, the bigger companies like Harley and Zero and, and those in the room. So mm-hmm. it's, it's anybody's guess how many are really out there. Um, but it definitely seems like there's a very active ridership community around them. 
Yeah, and and with uh, Saunders Metacycle being kind of not non-existent anymore, I wonder if that's going to pull a lot of people over here. Um, yeah, it's definitely. Not quite as cheap, but it's kind of in the same ballpark as the Metacycle. Yeah, though, and and I met with the uh, founder and the designer of the bike. And uh, that was one of the things that we actually talked about. And he sort of explained to me how for them, it was very important to not go down that sort of like business path of basing your company's financial success on pre-orders or payments of the previous batch of bikes. And so they ensured that they got, you know, funding ahead of time and that, um, you know, any reservations they were taking were not funding the production kind of thing. They also yeah. received a good amount of grant money from the state of California as well. So that's certainly helped. But it sounds like they've started with the right business principles, which is very comforting when the bad taste of the Metacycle debacle is still in many people's mouths. Yeah, you don't want to, uh, what do you call that pyramid scheme? You don't want to base your... Oh, the Ponzi pyramid. scheme, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to base your business model on a Ponzi scheme. That's not the way to go. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, Non-bike bike gear tested. Hover Air X1 is a cyclist drone I've been looking for. Yeah, so I started doing uh, on the weekends a, a bit of like a different uh, review thing where, um, you know, a lot of the gear that I use for, for biking because I try to be as car free as possible. Uh, a lot of this gear is really important to sort of like making the experience for me, but um, we don't see a lot of this stuff behind the scenes. So in this case, for years, I've been looking for a drone that I could take on bike trips, both on bike rides and when I'm traveling to do, you know, like uh, bike trips internationally. And even like my DJI Mini 3, which is my like normal travel drone is kind of big. And because I usually try to travel just in a, with a backpack, it takes up so much space. So this is the first one I found that is like the perfect drone to take on a bike and film all of my bike stuff. It's called the Hover Air X1. It's not like cheap, cheap. It's still, I want to say like 370 bucks. So it's a bit of an investment, but as you can see from the, the video here, the quality is actually quite good. Like I can use this stuff professionally. Like the tracking is great. Uh, it films at, I think, um, uh, 1400 pixels or something. I think it's like 2.7 K. So, you know, it's not 4k footage, but it's not 1080 and it's just tiny. Like it literally folds up to fit in the palm of your hand and there's no controller, which is like the real beauty here, because that's what really gets you with when you um, want to bring a, a, a drone along on your bike. It's not like you just bring the drone, like the controller is often like the size of the drone as well. So it's all this more packing, but this one I can literally put in my pocket and I forget it's there. Like I don't even need a backpack to bring it. It takes off out of the palm of your hand. You tell it in advance what type of shot you want. So there's like multiple mode buttons on the top of it and you can tell it, you know, like do an orbit shot or do a follow me shot or, you know, like shoot up in the sky and get like a downward perspective and it'll just do it. And then when it's done, it comes back to you and you hold out your hand and it lands in your hand. Like it's the future. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Like, they're not paying me to say any of that. Like this is the thing I've been looking for and I finally found it. You know, if it could film 4k, that would be, you know, like the cherry on top but I only output in 1080p anyway. So uh, I usually film at 4K just so that I have room to crop in. And this one still lets me crop about like 50% or so. So um, to me, this is just like that perfect cyclist drone I've been looking for, something I can take on all my bike rides and not even think about it. You know, not even have to like stop and take it out of my backpack. Like it's, it's literally already in my pocket. So this was just so cool for me. And it allows me to get all those shots that I miss because I don't bring, uh, you know, a drone to be able to get those cool, like high level perspective shots on rides. So I, I'm super excited about this and I just had to share it with everyone. So that, 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 uh, handheld thing you have there, that's, that's kind of the controller. Um, the, the or, thing in or, my hand right there. No, like if we're looking at the screen, is that the top of the drone or is that like a remote control? Yeah. yeah that's, that's the top of the drone. Um, oh, okay. it does look like a, yeah, like a, uh, Amazon Fire TV remote or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so how do you tell it to like? How do you get it to lock on you? So it just locks on you from takeoff because the only way it'll take off is out of your hand. So you have okay. to hold it out um, like that, and so it's already looking at you 
when it takes off, you push the button on the top and it like recognizes you on takeoff and you are the subject now. Okay. So it'll um, base everything off of you uh, unless you choose one of the flight modes that's, you know, not tracking. But most of the time I'm doing tracking stuff. If you do want to fly it like, you know, a normal drone, quote unquote, uh, you can use your phone through the um, through the app and then you can go into manual control and you can like, you know, just take off and get a, a landscape view or, you know, sometimes I like to get like a high level shot to establish, you know, if you're like in the mountains or something, you get like three seconds of mountain footage. So you can do that and control it like a normal drone. But most of the time, what I really want is to get pictures or videos of me riding a bike and so for that, it's just incredible. And I'm often by myself, which is the kicker. Like, you know, when you're doing a one man band, like you don't have a cameraman. So a drone that can follow you is your only option if you want moving video of yourself. Yeah, totally. Um, what is the um, like top speed? Like if you're going fast on your e-bike, how, where, where does it, you know, where can it keep up with you? It's a good question. Um, I haven't maxed it out because usually I'm riding like trails and stuff. So I don't think I got up more than like, I don't know, 10, 12 miles an hour kind of thing while I'm off road. Uh, I haven't tried it on like a, a busy road where I can get going fast. Um, so I'll have to look that one up. But, um, you know, for in terms of the tracking, I, I've never had it lose me yet, which is wild because I tried to lose it. like I would like ride between trees and stuff. Uh-huh. And like, I couldn't believe that it, it kept following. Like, it, oh, no, you know what? It, it did once get, uh, I guess it lost me, and, like, it just kind of hovered there. Um, but it didn't crash into anything, which was good. So, yeah, I did I did sort of lose it once in terms of it not being able to track me. But I think I've used it on um, three different review videos already in terms of, like, getting usable footage that I that I use. And I think only once it's, it's actually, like, not been able to keep up or track me. That's interesting. Um, I've been using uh, the DJI Mini 4, and uh, we talked about the Psy Rusher before. I'm, I'm throwing a little uh, footage on the screen right now. Uh, this is my son um, because apparently I weigh too much for the uh, the, the motor to catch snow. But um, this is the DJI uh, Mini 4 on the uh, uh, just uh, with with uh, Active Track. And it does kind of the same thing. It does a pretty good job of it. Um, but I would say, like, there's some serious issues with the uh, active track. Like, you have to be in wide open spaces. Like, I don't think it would have done the same uh, stuff that you did. Um, I, I get beeping, like, when we go through, like, trees and stuff. And the top speed on that is not great either. It's, you know, a little over 20 miles per hour, especially with wind conditions and the cold battery and all the other stuff for snowboarding. Um, it does present some issues. So... Um, I am definitely interested in checking out other things. How much, how much did this thing cost? I think it's 370 though. You bring up a good point that I forgot to mention, which is battery life. That is a downside here. So mm-hmm. the batteries are very small. It's like nine to 10 minutes oh, of wow. flight yeah. time. Okay. But on the other hand, because of the flight style where it sort of like films and clips, it takes off, does the clip you told it and comes back. You're not like just hovering around loitering burning battery so you know i can go out and and get you know like a dozen different like cool shots you know each one's a clip on a single battery um which surprised me knowing you know how small the battery is going in i did buy a second battery just in case but i find that like on an hour-long ride like just stopping you know 10 times to get cool clips i would still have battery left like it's just it's rarely in the air for more than a minute at a time that's cool. Um, and what is the retail price on these? Uh, th- I think it's three seventy. Um, I think so. I think on Amazon it was actually something like four seventy with a hundred dollar coupon. You know, you got to like click the box, right. Right. which I never understood. Like, if it's just a clicking a box, just yeah, apply the know. yeah. But I mean, it's just here. You can see it folded up. Um, the other thing is like if you saw in the the video that I did there, like the minute of clips, it actually um, I like reached out and like brushed a palm tree as we went by. And then the, yeah, I saw that. the leaves came back and hit the drone. Oh, did but they? because it's in uh, like protected um, prop guards, it was fine. Like it just like bumped it and it kept going. It was, um, uh, oh, that's actually the, the bike review that I used it oh, in. Yeah, so, um, um, but in terms of like, you know, protection, like it comes with its own prop guards. So you don't have to worry about it hitting stuff, which is my biggest fear with my, 
DJI mini drone. I mean, I've crashed it like four or five times into trees and it's still working, but like one of these days it's not going to like fly again after the next crash. Yeah. So it actually looked like this... you knew it was coming. Like you try to keep yeah. the, uh, the palm fronds out of the way. Yeah. But I think I just like slingshotted them into it. <laughs> right. Right. No, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's great footage. I just, uh, like, I wonder for snowboarding if this would be a good, good tool. Um, cause, uh, you know, we're always trying to get, uh, some snowboarding video and the DJI mini isn't up to the task for a couple of different reasons. Yeah. That one, the only thing I worry about is if it does lose you, like you got to go back up the mountain to get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that is a problem. Yeah. It's problematic for a couple of reasons because like you have to keep looking backwards to make sure it's still back there. And then, you know, you hit a tree or something. It's just kind of annoying. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so this one, I mean, it does have its limitations, but like for this specific use, which is why I think it's a really cool biking drone. It's just like, it's the perfect thing to take on a bike ride to me. Yeah. Maybe we will do a drone DJ, uh, a deep dive into this thing. That'll be cool. All right. And the last story of this week is, uh, so Speaking of deep dives, um, we had a washer washer incident at our home where uh, we had a huge leak coming out of our washing machine. So uh -oh. um, I I immediately went into all right. I'm going to figure out what's the next big thing in washer <laughs> washers. And uh, a few days later, we ended up buying a GE profile, and that was uh, I think in December. And then a few days later at CES, before our our washer even arrived. Um, LG came out with a similar product, uh, in a lot of ways, better product. Um, so I decided I was going to deep dive into these two things. So, um, this is the GE profile, um, called ultra fast and it's got a, you know, product name. And then the LG model is called the LG wash combo and they're both heat pump washer dryer combos. So, um, as you probably know, uh, overseas, like outside of the U S, um, dryers aren't nearly the same thing as they are in the U S in the U S the big hulking, you know, energy sucking heat monsters basically. And, you know, outside the U S there's a lot of heat pumps. There's a lot of just line drying. Um, I know a lot of times when we were in France, uh, we were just hanging up our stuff and that's just how things were. Um, but in the U S people kind of expect a big, uh, dryer that works in like an hour. Um, whereas, you know, the line drying takes overnight at best. And then, uh, they do have uh, washer dryer combos overseas that, you know, oftentimes, uh, they they're in the kitchen or they're, they're in, you know, tight spaces, uh, <laughs> with no ducting. So, um, you have, uh, these washer dryer combos that kind of boil, uh, the water that's in your clothes and that kind of ruins your clothes or, you know, the elastic no longer works in your socks and, you walk around with like, you know, the socks around your ankles and it's just kind of a mess in that scene. So recently, um, it, you know, all over heat pumps are obviously the, the big new thing, but with the GE profile that was, uh, released in the middle of last year, um, ultra fast, um, you have a heat pump that, uh, is built into the washer. So that's a kind of a new thing for the U S you know, full size washing machine market, um, but it, it's also, um, it, it dries the um, clothes in a different way. Rather than producing just heat and, you know, kind of hope, hoping for the best, um, this is kind of a dehumidifier. It's a heater and a dehumidifier in one. So a heat pump kind of separates hot and cold, hot and cold air, hot and cold water, whatever. So um, the, the dry, you know, the washer thing happens kind of like normal. The heat pump, you know, may heat the water a little bit better or whatever. But the, the real magic is in the drying. And that's, so the heat pump um, heats up uh, the, the wet clothes. And then um, the cool side of the heat pump, so it, it separates the hot and cold. The cool side acts as like a condenser. So basically it, it turns into a dehumidifier inside your washing machine. It separates the hot and the cold. So it applies the hot to the, to the clothes. And then the cold side is basically suck you know condensing uh the water from your clothes onto the the coils in in the uh in the in the washer dryer and this is all happening inside a closed circuit so there's not hot air coming out there's not cold air coming out it's all happening inside 
So what happens is over the period of an hour, um, you know, your clothes are tumbling, they're being heated up, but the, the water inside the clothes is being condensed against these cold coils and, you know, being absorbed. And then, you know, uh, just it ends up outside, uh, you know, a drain, like the water drain that just like, you know, your, your soapy water goes. So you don't need ducting, which turns out to be a big deal. Um, most people don't understand, like the hot air just gets shot outside and that's all there is. <laughs> but, um, you know, as far as energy efficiency is concerned, I mean, if you live in a, a climate where, you know, you have your screen door open and there's no HVAC happening, probably not a big deal that it's sucking a bunch of air out, out your back. But um, in places like where I live, it's, you know, it's 30 degrees outside right now. Um, all that air going out um, is going to be replaced by something in the house. And that basically is the air outside, which is 30 degrees. And that's coming in through cracks in the, you know, under the door and the windows and through the insulation. So basically you're replacing all the air in your home with cold air from outside and your HVAC system, whether it's, you know, anything has to heat up that air again. So not only are you saving a lot of energy uh, with the actual heat pump, but you're probably doubling the savings if you live in a cold or ultra hot place, you know, the opposite effect with the heating and cooling, um, you're, you're saving double the money there. So I kind of figured, so let me just go down the 10, 10 best list. You have energy efficiency. That's, you know, kind of the big overwhelming thing. Um, because of the uh, lower energy use, you also don't need a 240 volt outlet. And that's particularly important right now because people are replacing their heating and, and cooling systems with heat pumps, people are adding uh, electric cars, which require 240 volt, or, you know, usually require 240 volt things in their, their garage, um, those kind of things. And, and adding space to your, um, you know, getting a new breaker box or getting a, a new wire out to your house often costs $2,000. Well, that's just the price of this thing. So if you, if you're getting a new car, and you have a washer dryer in your, um, if you're getting an EV and you need a plug and your breaker box is full and you have a washer dryer in your garage already, you know, replace the dryer or the, you know, both of them with this. And then you have a, a basically a, a 240 volt plug right in your garage already. So it, it makes things a lot easier. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the, the duct work thing, uh, you, you have to send air out. So you have a pump there. It's noisy. It's loud. Um, save space. Builders can put washer dryers in the middle of a home. You can put them in a closet. As long as you have water coming in and out, you could, if you have a walk-in closet, you could have your washing machine dryer in your closet. Clothes never need to leave the closet unless they're on you. It's it's kind of a, a magic thing. You can use the, the thing as a hamper like we do. Um no longer have to move clothes from washer to dryer. That's kind of a, a no brainer. Like that's kind of a pain, you know, middle of the night, you have to switch it over. Uh, <laughs> ventless means lower home heating, cooling costs. We talked about that. Um, it's also general around clothes. Like you're not super heating clothes with super dry air. Um, so clothes last longer. Um, they're also quieter running. So you don't have the air going out of your house. That that's uh, noise keep you up at night, all that kind of stuff. Um, the long-term cost savings is, is kind of the big deal. Like obviously these things are pretty pricey at $2,000 to $2,500 right now. Um, but that that's both, it replaces both units. So you're talking about like replacing a thousand dollar washer and a thousand dollar dryer with a $2,000 um, dual purpose. I think that's not bad, but there's also, um, you know, time of use savings to think about. Um, there's uh, federal state and local rebates in the US. Uh, in Vermont, there's currently a $400 rebate that brings it down $400. And then there's a $840 federal IRA thing that they haven't figured out yet, but it's going to be there and hopefully it's retroactive. Um, so tons of tons of benefits. And you know, these things are even so cool that they have um, dispensers. So you basically just dump like your fabric softener and your detergent into these reservoirs. And then based on the size of your load, it you know, squirts out the r proper amount of detergent and fabric softener. So I'm just over the, over the moon with these things. I think they're 
phenomenal. I might even start doing my own. No, nah, just kidding. I <laughs> I do my own watching. <laughs> so, uh, downsides. Uh, the uh, biggest difference is that uh, you basically get cold, uh, and it feels like it's wet, but it's not really wet. You get cold uh, stuff at the end, even though you know it used to be fun when you were a kid. But your mom would just get the hot laundry and like throw it on top of you, and you're like, ah, this feels great. Except for the snaps, that hot then. energy wasting uh, laundry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get the snaps and the uh, zippers burning a hole in your arm, but <laughs> no big deal. It's part of it. Yeah, it's part of the fun. Um, so yeah, the, the the other thing is like when you when you get the thing out of the it feels a little bit like it's wet, but it's actually just colder and more humid. And then you, you, you take it out and it's, it's dry. It's a very weird sensation. Um, the other thing is like, if you're rapid fire doing laundry, like you move from the wash to the dryer and you're basically doing one hour cycles of each. Can't do that with this. If you're going to do that, get two of them, I guess. Um, it's quite heavy. So I think it's over 350 or 300 pounds, 300 to 350 pounds, whereas a normal washer dryer is closer to 200. That's because it's got, you know, a heat pump on top and a, a washer below. Um, so not, not, a, not a lot of uh, uh, issues there. What are your thoughts here? I've never wanted to nerd out so much about a washer or dryer, um, but it is fascinating to me. And to be honest, I it sounds silly, but I never realized before that, yeah, when you have a vent pushing all that air out of your house you're just sucking cold air back into your house yeah or hot air in the summer well it's like, got to go somewhere right yeah yeah I, I never really thought about that yeah no i haven't honestly, had a sorry yeah the negative pressure thing is is fascinating to me because i mean you if you really want to nerd out like actually it can be problematic if you have uh fiberglass insulation for instance or rock wool um and air is coming through that it's basically picking up microscopic like uh fiberglass and putting it into your house you know and you're breathing oh you yeah know. so there's, there's things like that i mean it's not a huge problem but it's like it 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 kind of spirals into other stuff whereas this is kind of a self-contained unit um it doesn't get hot doesn't get cold um it uses less than a kilowatt hour per wash which is kind of crazy when you think about you know the, a typical wash is uh anywhere from three to six kilowatt hours so you're talking about one third to one sixth of the energy. Um, yeah, that was crazy when I read that. Like, I couldn't believe that it was that little amount of power. Like, it, to put that in perspective, you could run that off of like a juiced e bike battery. Like, you could yeah. run a whole wash cycle and yeah, dry cycle. I know it, it is crazy. And that, and that's kind of like on the high end, like a typical wash would be like 600 uh, watt hours. So, a rad battery. Yeah, yeah. Smaller, <laughs> smaller e bike battery. <laughs> That's, put it in terms that's, I understand. Maybe that's something I should do on the uh, the review is run run one off the uh, what what was that um, the solar one? I can't remember. Oh, the it. um mock wheel. Yeah, the mock wheel. Uh, yeah, uh, that'll be a good. Uh, oh, that would be fascinating. Yeah, and and the big you know I I talked about it a little bit. For me, it's actually like real. Um, eliminating a two forty volt outlet is a big deal in when your uh, breaker box is full of um, breakers and, you know, if you want to go to the next level, you got to buy a new breaker box and you got to get an electrician out and they got to do all the, the work. And that's, that's $2,000 right there. Like you could save that money and get a, you know, washer dryer. Uh, it, it's kind of a nutty proposition. Yeah. Yeah. That is wild. Um, it's, it's funny because it's something I've never thought about because I don't think I've ever had, a dryer like since i left home like my okay. mom's dryer was my last dryer but um then again my wife and i are just two people so you know we get by with with the sun if you're you know four people with a lot of laundry that, that yeah, might not work lot, as well we have a lot less sun than uh, israel slash florida too so yeah sure um, thing yeah but you know when i travel i'm pretty used to like hanging stuff and it's not not weird or anything but you know this this kind of makes it like super easy because you put the stuff in at night and in the morning there's clean clothes. You know, it's, it, it's pretty simple. Like it, it, it's not folding it yet for us, but you know, maybe, maybe that's the next, uh, the next, <laughs> the next level. The, the Slow next down. <laughs> yeah. The, theoretically when I replace this in 12 years, it, it should be folding. 
should be folding and have a little TV built into it. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, if you guys are interested in nerding out on that, that's a really long and tedious uh, post I did on on the whole heat bump washer dryer scene. I think it's going to be a big deal. Like I think all washer dryers will be like this in a few years. Um, so yeah, check it out. All right, should we move to comments here? Let me get that off the screen. All right. Um, Ismail Yusuf, uh, nice concept, but I would like to see a few longer tumor reviews. I think that's talking about the... Uh, oh, propeller. The, no, I, actually, I think it was the disc brake thing. That was pretty early. Oh, uh, right, 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 yeah. Um, well, maybe it was the propeller because it's 906. Anyway, uh, yes, either of them, <laughs> I want to see uh, long-term <laughs> reviews. Uh, a more open concept for holding cargo. Uh, that's... that's at, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say I might be propeller, but that's not too late. Which one was that? I got to think it's the propeller. Perhaps. All right. Maybe we should do these more real time in the future. <laughs> the problem is that sometimes people are watching the video, you know, with a lag. So oh, that's right. So, all right. We have a lot of talk about the hover uh, drone. Uh, hover air is great. Only issue for bikes is you can't ride fast. Yeah, I kind of. I brought that up, that question up. Um, we'll have to get a, I'm sure there's a spec on the, the speed there. Um, keep up the great work. The 2K is very crisp video. So, all right, we got another uh, thumbs up for the video quality. I, I just looked it up because I was curious. It's 15 and a half miles an hour. Oh, 15 and a half. That's not bad. That's a European e-bike spec. Yeah, it explains why I wasn't losing it because I was <laughs> really going that fast off-road. Yeah, so uh, not at all good for snowboarding unless you you know you're doing jumps and wiping out a lot and stuff. <laughs> all right, uh, three ninety nine. I'm not sure what that was for. That's probably the price of the the drone. Oh, the, okay. And then, uh, well worth it. All right, that's pretty much it, I think. Oh, we have one right. one thing. Mike, take a look at the wired e bikes and e cells five star. A lot of buzz going on. About. I'll have to add that to the list to look at. How close they are. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for taking part as well as tuning in. Uh, we'll be excited to see you guys next time in another two weeks on the Wheelie Podcast.